compared to the other Chinese instruments, the Yang Qin is not the most popular one. We see much more examples, you know, of people playing the Erhu, the Pipa, the lute, or the Dizi, the Chinese flute, or the Gu Zheng, the 21 string zither. But the Yang Qin is like, what is that? Like, it looks like a chimbalong, but I didn't know that there's a Chinese counterpart. That's what a lot of people tell me. People's first impression of the instrument is oh, very angelic sounding, you know, very soft and an echoey instrument, and that's it. Like oh, beautiful instrument, yay, wonderful. But I wanted them to see the grotesque side of the instrument. I wanted them to see that this instrument is actually very raw and fresh, depending on the way you treat it. We don't have to always think about the culture surrounding it. It's okay to extract that out and then write it as objectively as we can and think of it in terms of sonic combinations like what kind of new sounds we can achieve. The first time I was introduced to you was when we were at Juilliard, right? Yeah. We started at Juilliard together. I was doing my master's 2014, but I can't really remember when you when did you start? Um, I started my undergrad there uh, 2015 to okay. 2019. Oh, you were an undergrad? Yeah. At the, oh, I have to be honest because when you, I remember your music at that time and it, um, I can't remember specific pieces, but I just remember after hearing your pieces in the recital, I thought, oh, this is a very mature composer. Oh, oh I didn't God. think you were okay. an undergrad. And when oh. I found out that you were an undergrad, I think I did find out later, I was really surprised. Oh, that's an honor for me. So you were in Singapore before Juilliard. I... So in Singapore, did they have like a big like classical musical scene, because I have absolutely no idea. It's one of the most busiest um, hubs of classical music in Asia. Like, uh, okay. I mean, aside from the big Taiwan, Hong Kong, China, like uh, we are the, a very small country, but among Southeast Asia, like we're one of the most important ones. Like the Singapore International Violin Competition was held there, and then we have the Yang Suto Conservatory of Music, where a lot of, uh, it's actually free tuition, by the way, and it has a lot of students from around the region, like Thailand or uh, even Taiwan students. There's a place in Singapore, yeah. an institution that has free tuition for uh, instrumentalists and composers? I, I believe so, for undergrad only. For undergraduates yes, only? Yes, yes. So, but you didn't end up going there, you went to Juilliard Yeah, instead. I applied for that So as why one of go my to options. Juilliard instead of this free place at, in Singapore. Because I, I, I wanted to learn in a more embracing environment. I wanted, uh, I like the teachers at Juliet, the faculty there. I love their music. So I, I decided to follow my heart. And to New York. Teachers. Yes, and decided to go to a new country. And, be, and I love Juliet. Uh, I've always been a fan of Juliet for many years. Like, um, not as a fan of the composers, because I didn't know anyone. It's more like uh, the musicians there, you know, like Sarah Chang, Isaac Perman, who taught there, who mm -hmm. teaches there. So I, I like. The, I feel like it's a very enlightening place to be in. So I decided to go there to study. Did you apply anywhere else? Mm -hmm. Do you remember applying anywhere else? I, in the I US? applied. No, I only applied oh, wow. Juliet, and then I applied. Uh, Singapore's uh, Yong Suto Conservatory, and that's it. And then I, I got Christ. both, but I decided to come. <laughs> I Because I only started writing at six, 15, 16, so I didn't um, have much experience writing, and I didn't know what level I was at. So I just wanted to try my luck. I just learned, and then I maybe talked to a, a few teachers in Singapore about where I could head to, and they all gave me good advice to just follow my heart and just write whatever I want to write, and then apply yeah, so I was very lucky to be to be ending up here. And so when you came to New York, yeah. for, was that the first time when yeah. you went to Juilliard? Yes. Oh wow! And what did you end up in the dorms? Uh, in the dorms. Yeah. Oh, what of was course. that like? <laughs> the dorms. I can tell life, you, everyone knows what, what I a, thought of it. It was a very chaotic life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> chaotic time there because there are all kinds of people that you will meet. Yeah. And it's very fun. No, the good thing is that you you always hear music in the hallways. It's very inspiring. And um, and it's nice to bump into people that you know, but because I'm personally a very introverted person, so I prefer to be in my own room all times of the day. So <laughs> it's hard living in the dorms, but you know it was it was a memorable time, and I think that was the only time I would live in the dorm because when I grow older, I want my own space. So. Well, I mean, you were there for your bachelor's degree, and then you went mm -hmm. off for your master's degree. So you just went through six years straight. Went through, through right? six years, yeah. So when you when you went through, did you find any difference between doing the bachelor's and doing the master's, or did it feel like mm -hmm. six years straight and there's no difference between? 
the two uh, degrees? Uh, um, for me, um, there was one thing that was consistent was that um, I know that people already knew my style of writing and they know who I am. So I feel more comfortable. I didn't have mm-hmm. to try so hard to impress, you know, the new faculty if I didn't know that before. I didn't have to like go out of the way to prove myself. Like I already have a network of friends that I trust who would play my pieces. And I like the faculty, the composition faculty quite a bit. So they were all pretty supportive of my music. That's at least that was during my time there. So I felt like it was very comfortable. I didn't have to stress too much about, you know, proving myself or anything. Yeah. I mean yeah. I connect personally with what you do yeah. because you incorporate a lot of what you do from your ancestral background mm. and you also play some of these instruments, right? And you also play in the violin, yeah. right? So like all these things together, I, I really connect with it. Mm. And when I heard your music for the first time at oh. Juilliard, I, 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 I heard some kind of fresh voice because usually it's hard to incorporate a lot of that mm. ancestral music in your background. There's mm. some, it could sound gimmicky at points. Mm. It could sound oh, of course you're doing that because you're from that place. Yeah. But it, I don't get that feeling from your music. And I want to mm. play one of uh, these pieces, if you don't mind, a solo okay. violin piece. I think it's very representative of this, oh, kind of, yes. this kind of thing that I heard. But this is from 2020. This is before Daybreak for a solo violin. And um, I'm going to play this part called Ode of Remembrance, mm. uh, which, is, which you'll see in the score. Mm. This piece before daybreak, it was written around COVID, right? Or yeah. after or before COVID? It was during COVID. During COVID. Yeah. So how did this piece come about? So there was a call for scores for the Singapore International Violin Competition. It was originally planned for 2020, uh, but it got postponed because of the COVID situation. And uh, it was during April of 2020 that they announce this call for scores so at that time i was i don't know still doing my masters at juliet i was in my first year so i decided to um, and at that point of time you know school has stopped you know we're all asked to go home you know to uh, study virtually so i decided to go back to singapore at that time and i went back to singapore on an 18-hour flight and then i had to quarantine in a hotel there for three weeks or two weeks, I, I think oh. it was three weeks. So I was there for a good three weeks and I was like, okay, I have to do something, you know, I can't just like let myself in a room and I have to eat all my meals That's It's very claustrophobic because I can't go out. So I decided, why don't I just try for this call for scores? And I play the violin, I know the violin pretty well. So I started writing a piece, you know, just like that. And slowly, every day, adding a few measures, every few notes, and then I'm done with the piece in about two weeks. And then by the last week, I was like, I had nothing else to do. So I just read a book. And then when I got out of quarantine, I immediately went home and uh, found a violin to try some of the fingerings and the chords to make sure that they all work and the harmonics. And then after, I, after that, I submitted the score to the call for scores and thankfully I managed to get it. So I was the only composer who, who actually won this call for scores and they chose my piece as the commissioned piece, commissioned new work for the semi-finalists to play. Uh, for the competition. Uh, unfortunately, the competition was pushed back and it happened last year, 2022, December. So we had about 12 really great semi-finalists from all around the world who played that commission piece as part of their recital program for the competition. Wow. So I was there uh, for three days and I listened through you know, from morning to night 
uh, all these 12 um, beautifully uh, played renditions of my music and I had a lot of fun just trying to appreciate everyone's interpretations. Wow, I gotta back up a little bit. So you, you started for this piece from zero. You yeah. didn't know if anybody was gonna play it, yeah. right? And then you find out about this, you knew about the competition was for solo violin. Yes. You submit the piece while you're in quarantine. Yes. And then it wins, and then you have all these violinists playing it. So that's yeah. basically right there. That's the <laughs> that's the dream scenario for any composer. Yeah, it's really it doesn't happen a dream. that often. I don't think it will happen ever again in my life. No, because that's a it's rare scenario. So rare. Yeah. yeah, unless because I'm also not very established. I consider myself to be still emerging career. We are forever emerging. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we're forever emerging. Oh, that, I had um, Timo Andres sitting right there. I don't know if you know him. Mm. He has a piece for the LA Phil this season. And on the um, on the pamphlet mm -hmm. uh, or the brochure says the young rising uh, composer Timo Andrus. I said Timo Andrus is not a. First of all, the guy is like forty or almost forty years old. He's not a young uh, chick anymore, and he's not rising. He's there. He's a. He's a. He's, a, he's already there. I don't know what they're talking about. So mm. I think we're forever. <laughs> we're forever, forever merging rising. until we're dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, but I was very grateful for this opportunity. Also, I have to thank one of my friends, Kevin Drew, one of the most amazing violinists I ever knew. Uh, he actually provided some advice about the piece during my, you know, my uh, quarantine time in Singapore. So I actually showed him the piece. I just wanted to make sure that a professional violinist, mm -hmm. a soloist like him can play it, you know, because it's not, it's, you know, for me, trying things on a violin, you know, when I do things slow, everything seems possible. <laughs> but when it's him trying it in actual tempo, then he can tell me, you know, the slurring is a little bit weird here, the fingering, I would advise you to change it to this instead. So he gave me quite some advice for that one hour that we talked. So he helped me improve the piece better for the violinist. I mean, this is something that's extremely important, right? Yeah. I mean, we can't we can't pretend to know mm. everything about And you play the violin yeah. and you still consult it with somebody uh, else. Exactly, and I find yeah. that fascinating. Mm. But um, this particular excerpt that we heard, there are a couple strange notational things in it that actually I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. I think one of them was an X uh, leading into this diamond note mm -hmm. header. It might have been the other way around. I have to look at the score mm -hmm. again. But what is going on here? Because it's such a subtle, subtle technique, mm -hmm. but you do it so often in this section, mm -hmm. and then you have it actually later on. Yes. And it just is just the right amount mm -hmm. of little extra to give this piece the life that it is because i think without that it would have been a completely different uh, mm -hmm. piece it would yeah. have just sounded a lot more normal or whatever yes. you want to call it or vanilla or yeah. wh whatever word you want to use but just with those little things you did there it completely changed the affect of the piece right, right. so i when i was writing the piece i was thinking a lot about the chinese fiddle the erhu sound um, because this whole piece is actually my own imagination of um, the feelings of loss and grief. In, it's called Before Daybreak, so it's actually based on um, the Emperor Tang of Tang Dynasty. Um, he's mourning over his the loss of his most beloved concubine, whom he actually caused the death of, by the way. So that was an, that's another Yikes. story. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, so, <laughs> so um, it's pretty gnarly. But uh, that aside, so... Uh, it's a really long, like 108 line Chinese poetry. It's very well written. It's very effective. So I wanted to capture that um, that singing quality into the music. And the Chinese traditional fiddle called the Erhu, which has only two strings, um, is one of the most fascinating instruments on earth, in my opinion, because it really captures the singing voice so well. Not just because of the the strings, you know, the way the strings are are made, the textures, but also the articulation that you can do on the instrument. So in that part of my piece, I have all those diamond, uh, the, the those notational um, uh, little dots there. And th but that's actually for um, the vibrato, uh, mm. the strength of the vibrato, the pressure of the vibrato. Because when you're playing the erhu, you can actually there's one technique called the yaro. Ya ro, which means to press and then vibrate. So the pressing itself uh, doesn't really, you can't really hear it um, orally, but it actually helps in the intensity of the vibrato. So mm -hmm. with the with the violin, so there's one part, it's like, ta -yum, ta -yum. like I like that part where you, you press and then you, you vibrate. So there's a, a short gap in between 
that sound, uh, the two sounds. So I wanted that to be the most important aspect of this Ode to Remembrance because that's the most uh, melodious section of my piece. So uh, I was thinking of the sound of the erhu and the erhu playing. So when you do that, mm. you just sang it there, which was very clear. But what is the bow doing? So the, the, the left hand is doing duh, this mm. kind of thing. What is the right hand doing this the, whole time? The right hand is also um, complementing the left hand by also pressing it a little bit. Uh -huh. Yes, but I think the main feature is the left hand. The left hand. But it's not, a, yes. it's not, you're not mm. bowing. You're not doing a second bow. Yes. It's one bow. It's one bow. Oh, it's one bow. Okay. It's one bow. God, yeah. I think it's there's a slur in there, right? You yes. put a slur. Yes, I just don't remember. I need to have the score in front of me, but yep. um, I think yes, like you said, one slur. Yeah. So you have this uh, one motion in the mm -hmm. right hand, and then two motions in the left hand, mm -hmm. but it's on the same note. Yes. yes. Yeah. It's so simple, you know, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, but you you know we don't think about this mm -hmm. kind of closeted in the Western. Yeah thought that you could play the violin in this way. Mm, it helps and create colors that we never imagined. And hearing all 12 different versions was really like memorable because not all of them are like Chinese, of course. And the not 12 all of violinists. Them, yeah, and they're right. all from different parts of the world. Like not all of them know the sound of the erhu. So how do you replicate that? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the program I wrote, you know, this is inspired by erhu. So I'm hoping that a few of them or maybe more, most of them actually did some research, you know, hear the, how the instrument sounded like before they interpreted it. And uh, it's fascinating because all of them have had different like vibrato frequencies and they all have different expressive uh, techniques. So it's really cool how they integrated that into my score and helped made it much better than I am. You found it was different between the 12 violins. Uh, so different. Wow, like really? everyone had different interpret. Everyone had different strengths, you know. So I just wish I could, you know, give them a hug, like all of them, and say thank you all for playing so well, you know, my piece in different ways that I never imagined. So. And did you tell them to listen to one particular recording? No. Or did you say, this is the instrument, you go figure it out? Yes, and you go. That's a good way to do it, yeah. Because yeah. I've had the same problem too with some of my stuff where they want to know, okay, what exact Arabic, Okay. instrument or player you want me to emulate oh. and i'm like well, i don't really care so much about that mm -hmm. i want i want your interpretation i don't mm -hmm. want you to copy mm -hmm. what this superstar with many many years of mm -hmm. experience is doing right, right i want you to have your own relationship to the music so it sounds like you're a similar way yes, with the yeah. with the uh, with what you're doing mm, they have much yeah. more freedom to imagine that way so I, I appreciate that aspect, you know, when I write music for players, I also want them to have their own input. I, I'm not that kind of controlling personality. Mm. I don't want to make, make everything so clear in the score because the score is always uh, incomplete, the best traces of loss, in my opinion. So I, 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 it's supposed to be a place where possibilities can just uh, be born. So I, I wanted that to be the case for any music I write. Even if I have specific um, sound and color, like the technique that I was talking about, but I also hope that they bring their own version their, and their own understanding of what that means to them. Yeah, yeah no, but your music is quite uh, detailed uh, in terms of notation. <laughs> yeah. I think you're, I think you're uh, kind of uh, <laughs> dialing it down, but uh, I think it's quite detailed. Oh. Um, I mean, I've seen scores obviously where they're, I mean, they're really telling you exactly mm. what to play. But as far as scores go, I think it's quite detailed what you're what you're mm. asking. Oh. It's as long as it's clear, it doesn't matter All right. what um, you know how how much detail or how little detail you put in it. As long as the sound, like what you said, is what you wanted. Yeah. That is that is the main thing. So I'm like I'm like actually really curious now. So you you did the six years at Juilliard. It's going back to the school thing. Mm -hmm. What year was that all over? The master's degree. Uh, what years? What year? Or what year were you done with the master's? I was done with master's in 2021. 2021. Okay, mm -hmm. so you were at Juilliard a lot longer after. So you started at 2015. Mm -hmm. I ended at 2016. Yeah. So just one year overlap. overlap. Okay, so that makes sense. And then you finished quite recently, 2021. Okay. Yeah. So that 20, 2021 rolls around. How do you, what, what do you do then? <laughs> you finished your master's. What do you do then? Um, after I finished my master's, I continued on to my doctorate studies at NYU, New York University Graduate School of Arts and Science. Yeah, so I'm now a third year PhD student there. So you went straight through? I went straight through. You didn't have a to, break? Yeah. Wow. How do you feel about that, going six years and then now NYU is probably like a at least five-year program, yes, right? In yes. the States, the PhD degrees are a bit of... Yeah. 
a bit longer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is there a major any major differences between being at a place like Juilliard mm -hmm. and being like at a place like NYU? It's a huge difference. It's like I never I never expected how different it was until I actually went through it, because NYU, you know, first thing is a university. You know, there's there's bound to be people of all origins and all musical backgrounds, or not even you know musical backgrounds. So I learned how to really appreciate other things aside from just trying to be improving in my musical craft for example like some of them are like musicologists ethnomusicologists so they bring in so much from their own experience and their own research and those are really enlightening for me as a composer because I feel like as a composer a lot of my inspiration is from the world around me so it's really great to live through that world through the experience of experiences of my friends and and having conversations with these musicologists and ethnomusicologists, like they really open up my worldview. Like you know, previously in Juliet, it was more of like, oh, we're um we're all learning counterpoint in this way. You know, we're we're learning um, the European tradition is the most like most essential foundation that we all need to have. But in NYU, it's more like putting that aside and now let's focus what are some of the most uh, relevant issues and problems that are happening in our musical industry today. So we are learning how to see uh, issues that I've never seen before and I've managed to also grow a lot from that and to also reflect in my music, how can I uh, incorporate that new sense of uh, awareness in my own work. So it's a very different environment. I yeah, yeah. to be more open. Yeah, yeah no, I way. noticed that too. At mm. Juilliard, the, the focus was always on the music. There was never, mm. there was nothing else we ever talked about. Mm. And I also agree when I went to my doctorate studies, it was almost a little bit too much the opposite though, I have <laughs> yeah. to say. It kind of went, the, I don't know how it is at NYU, but it kind of went Similar, almost yeah. completely the other way as if the music, we rarely talked about music, mm -hmm. especially in seminars. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd play a piece of music but then we'd rarely hear how they came up with that piece of music. It was mm -hmm. usually more of a philosophical discussion yep. about the issues yes. that surround the piece, yep. but nothing about how the music was actually created. Exactly. Do you have the same feeling? Is it also the same yes. at NYU? Because this is the thing that I, that I realized at Columbia, at I, least. I have similar thoughts at you, as you, because in NYU, it was also more academic. So people were really great at talking and writing about music, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily care or more like they don't necessarily make music like I do or I did in Julia so I did really miss the uh, environment where I could hear music along the hallways and you know just study in depth and discuss with my friends you know, what do you think of this composer and what they do because I'm, I was the only one who was doing that like I, in class settings like people were, were mostly talking about the issues as you have mentioned you know about the let's say the piece the composer you know the studies about the composer but you know not everyone was really interested in making music or discussing music in detail so I think that's just not their focus their focus is more on the you know issues surrounding the music so it was actually you know, in my first year of studies that it was, to be honest, quite lonely because mm. I did miss the feeling of having composers around me and just, you know, going to concerts together. And But in NYU, people were all so different. Like, we're, I have, like, friends who make instruments. And I have friends who are very... who write mostly electronic music. I have friends who write film music. Like, they're all doing... We're all doing different things. You know, in a way, it's great because it's so diverse. You know, we all can learn so much from one another. Mm. But uh, on the, the flip side of that is that because we're all so different, we get even more isolated in what we are mm. doing. So I, I went there. I, I attended all the mandatory courses in musicology, ethnomusicology seminars. And then I went to my own room to do work. It's like that most of the time. Okay, occasionally I bump into my friends and we discuss, you know, hey, how's the work? You know, how's the reading going? You know, how, um, uh, how's the book so far? Have you read it? And then that was mostly our conversation. Like we didn't, we didn't really talk about the, let's say, the newest performance at Met, you know, the newest premiere, what was going on, you know. So it was actually quite lonely for me at first so but i've gotten used to it now that i'm in my third year so yeah oh, i i can't i can't tell you how similar of an experience i've had so it's oh. actually kind of uh reassuring in some ways oh. to hear also that you had a similar experience because mm -hmm. we had such a heavy conservatory 
yeah. background, yeah. Western conservatory yes. background, and then you come into a situation like this, uh, which is very academic, very research focused, and yeah. I feel like it's a blessing that we had the um, the kind of yes. conservatory training beforehand, mm -hmm. because it really puts into focus what our training is in our in our new context, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's an important thing just for anybody whoever was listening to this is that there was these very different modes of learning about music, right? Exactly. You learn it in this very academic way that's kind of divorced from reality in some ways, yes. the reality of musicians yep. working their gigs and, and learning about music and then yeah. trying to find a job. Mm -hmm. And then what we're doing, which is like, you know, we're more geared to, okay, how are we going, how are we going to discuss the issues mm -hmm. and how are we going to teach about this in a more, more broadly? Mm -hmm. So I think it's just a very different thing, but well, mm -hmm. at least we were exposed to it, mm -hmm. right? I was like, okay, so we're all discussing about the issues, but is discussing enough? Because mm. we're discussing in our very tight room, you know, right there, six of us, seven of us. And then what, what do we do about it afterwards? Like after class, it's just like normal. Like uh, we just go about our own activities. We continue to you know, create instruments. We continue to do our own research. But what, what happens to the discussion? So to me, I felt quite lost at the beginning because mm -hmm. I felt like it was very double-sided. You know, we're, we're, we're so deeply involved in class and after class we're like normal people <laughs> so i just i i'm i'm actually glad that i'm still writing music because mm -hmm. i get to apply that in my pieces i get to think more about who i'm writing for or for what occasion i'm writing for so i became more aware of that in my music i guess that's where i grew from that yeah, no, yeah. i i agree with everything that you just said i think you would have, you articulated it in such a way that i <laughs> that i haven't articulated quite like oh. this yet on this show so i appreciate that because that's how i feel too mm -hmm. but the nice thing about it is that you have a left brain right brain mm -hmm. situation going on now yeah. you have both sides working instead of at julia at a place like juilliard for example it's only one side of your brain mm -hmm. working it's like okay i gotta write as much music as possible i gotta write yeah. as much music as possible i gotta I gotta write for as many people as I can because yes, I because no like more people all right because like I don't what's gonna happen after like you're in this constant <laughs> yeah. rat race to keep yeah. writing music yes. without thinking too much about is this yeah. one better than the last one mm. what am I trying to do with this yeah. piece it's just a rat race of writing as much as you exactly. can before you're out mm. so you having this time at NYU to kind of slow down a little mm -hmm. bit figure out what is it that you want to do, mm -hmm. I think is very helpful. I mean, I think that kind of thinking helps a lot with, with this piece. I, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed listening to this one. Mountain of Echoing Halls mm -hmm. for Yang Qin and String Quartet. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I said Yang Qin correctly yes, or not, but this is, a, yeah. this is an instrument that you also play, yep. right? So let's hear a couple minutes of this. This is the, from the second movement. There are three movements. This is from the second movement. It's called Spirit Kings and Guardians. This piece is quite recent, yeah. right? And you played on it and you had a quartet. So there's a lot going on, a lot mm -hmm. more, obviously a lot more things going on mm -hmm. in this piece and the solo piece that we heard before. So how did this one come about? Mm -hmm. And did, I wondered, did your studies at NYU affect 
Oh, totally. Uh, the way that you wrote this this piece, because it's quite recent. Yes, because of the discussions that we had in our seminars, you know, we I've I've reflected much more about my identity as a composer. Because at Juliet, I was mostly writing abstract music and with a little bit of my heritage inside, but that wasn't the main focus or that wasn't active in my musical language. That was like one of the side ingredients, but it wasn't the main thing that I was uh, curious, most curious about to develop. So in NYU, because we, we all talk about identity, you know, sense of place, you know, where do we place this composer? How do we place him or her? And uh, what's the history behind the piece? You know, how did this piece come about? And how did the demographics help? So there, there was this part of my consciousness that got ignited, which was to actually explore more of my roots. So at NYU, I was able to explore the Yang Qin, the instrument that I played way more than I did at Juilliard. Because at Juilliard, it was mostly writing for my already talented Western instrumentalist friends, you know, like violinists, cellists, they're all amazing. Let me just write for them. But at NYU, it's like there are no musicians in our department. There are no active professional musicians or colleagues, I would say, around our age in my department. The, the active ones are mostly like faculty who are now teaching academic subjects. But because of the lack of musicians, I felt like, okay, so now I have to take on an active role and be the one championing my own music. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I get to uh, experiment more with the instrument that I have played since I was seven, which is the Chinese dulcimer, the Yang Qin. So um, it provided a great opportunity for me. And about this piece in particular, it was because I knew one of the Verona Quartet members called Jonathan Ong. He's also a Singaporean violinist. The Verona Quartet was the quartet in residence at Juliet, I believe, after I was doing my master's there. Yeah, so they were there for two years and I attended some of their concerts and I got to know Jonathan. And he's... Um, he, he, I'm, I'm grateful because he actually resonated with my music. So I found that, you know, maybe we could work something out together. So he initiated and asked me to write a piece for the Verona Quartet. Uh, so at this point in time, we were also lucky that the Smithsonian National Museum of Asian Art um, invited the Verona Quartet for a performance for their centennial celebrations. This was to happen at uh, Freer Gallery of Art. Uh, in Washington, D.C. So because of this opportunity, it was kind of a huge opportunity, by oh, the way. sounds big. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, as, a, as a Singaporean you know, composer in the U.S., like have, being able to contribute to the scene here, you know, it's already a huge you know, honor for me, especially for such a museum. You know. Also outside of New York. Yes, you outside going, of New now York. You're going nationally to D.C. Yes, yes. It's, um, my, my first time to D.C., I believe. So it's a very pivotal uh, milestone for me so I was I mean because of that I was uh, able to write a piece for them yeah and it's a commission from then it's an 18 minute work three movement and uh, I decided to involve myself because it's so rare to to be able to play with such great musicians and also they were curious about my instrument too so they wanted something interdiscipl interdisciplinary so they also asked about the possibility of having a dancer so then we decided to have a choreographer, dancer on board with us, and we created this piece together. Yeah, yeah I actually haven't heard, seen that version because I, yeah. I wanted to look at the, yeah. I wanted to watch the score while mm -hmm. listening to the piece because that's just the way I am. I, yeah. I really want to see the score. Yeah. But um, what was the impetus for you uh, playing? Uh, because like you said, you didn't play your, mm -hmm. that instrument mm -hmm. at Juilliard. Is it because of the commission? Mm -hmm. did they Did they... Did they ask you, did they approach you mm. to play that instrument or was it your idea to play your instrument along with so the quartet? So previously I have written a work for Yang Qin and Puro Ensemble and Percussion for uh, National Sawdust and Juliet Blueprint Fellowship. So that was in 2019. I wrote an inter interdisciplinary piece already. Uh, back then it was a quite successful venture because I noticed how well the Yang Qin blended together with the Western instruments. So then it became... Uh, it, it, it planted a seed in me that I need to do this next time. So when this opportunity with the Smithsonian came up, I was like, they asked that uh, they wanted something that's visual, first of all. They didn't ask for the instrument first. Mm. They asked for the visual aspect, so they wanted a dancer. So the dance idea came first, and then John and the Verona Quartet members asked if, you know, they knew I played the Yang Qin, 
decently. So they asked me if I would I like to. Decently. <laughs> yeah. this so they asked me like if, if me. I could join them together. So why not? Like such a great opportunity. I just had to figure out how to transport the young Jin over to. But that's that's easy. So I was uh, happy to be playing with them. But that mean that meant that I had to wear two different hats as a composer and a performer at the same time. So navigating the rehearsals was a little tricky because you know it's my. First time working with uh, non-schooling uh, musicians, a professional quartet. So in a in such a setting, so I had to make sure that I know when to become a composer and when to become a performer when rehearsing with them. But when you were rehearsing with them, mm. did you ever just say, "Okay, I'm not going to play. I'm just going to hear them first before mm. coming in"? Or were you like, "Okay, I need to figure out how to blend my sound mm -hmm. from the first rehearsal"? Like which one was it, or was we it only a combination? Had, we only actually had two rehearsals. Oh my God! With the dancers the too? Yes, the dancer was there. So it was like two days before the premiere. It's wow. very rushed. Yeah. <laughs> and I was full of doubt. I was like, how could we put this piece together? Because eighteen minute piece uh, and unfamiliar sounds, you know, and combinations. Like how do we do that? But they're so receptive and so open. So during their first rehearsal, I asked the the dancer to rest first, so that she could hear the music first and then we rehearsed but I make sure that uh, I don't play at certain moments when they are very involved because the role of the Yang Qin is not a soloist role I didn't want it to be a piece where you know the strings are just supporting me like I'm dead I'm that so-called exotically Asian instrument that needs to be at the forefront every time you know there are a lot of pieces where you can see like string quartet and the Chinese instrument for example where the string quartet is just accompanying and you can't really hear too much but you always hear that instrument that that uh, unusual instrument I didn't want the Yang Qin to have that function I wanted it to blend completely or as much as I could with the ensemble that I have so there are times where I let them play and I listen out to them um, during spots where the Yang Qing is not playing. So during my rest, uh, I would that's the chance for me to just sit back and listen out to their sound and then I try to think in my head. A lot of things, a lot of thoughts were happening. Okay, I need to blend. I know this player has this tendency, so I would make sure my sound is aligned with her or, or him. So and then when I came in with my part, like it was easier, so I was able to blend better. So yeah. No, I was surprised by that too, about how well that instrument blends with the string quartet. Yeah. Like it really, especially this this excerpt that we just played, where the instrument is so percussive, mm. because I almost didn't know which one mm. was the string quartet. If I wasn't looking at the score, oh. I couldn't really tell which one was the string quartet and which one. Is the is the Chinese instrument, and it and it kind of says also something about our society too, mm. in a way, because it's it's so it's so blended, mm -hmm. in, and especially in the U.S. Yeah, where does one start? Where does one end? Mm. So I thought that was, in terms of your identity question, I thought mm. that was kind of I don't know if this is what you meant, mm -hmm. but listening to it, there is a like a philosophical argument mm. being made, mm. even if it's just abstract music, yeah. without any words or mm. without even that being said in a program note. You can kind of get these oh. ideas from just listening to music, which is, I think, the most powerful thing about oh, music, right? You. Yeah, I didn't want the audience to have fixed expectations. You know, when they see a traditional instrument, they think that this music is going to play traditional music or parodies of that music. Mm -hmm. I wanted to write something that's much more uh, original, in my opinion, where I actually really experiment with what kind of sounds and sonic capabilities we can get by having that instrument it has to be a contribution not just you know for you know for the sake of it being there you know for um, diversity purposes i wanted it to actually have a real function um, because there's so many pieces where you have that traditional instrument inside and people just expect it to go a certain route like i wanted it to be very exploratory for myself as a composer. So in that excerpt that we played, I actually played uh, with the pedals of the instrument because the Yang Qing itself, um, the original form does not have pedals. Uh, it's only in the recent, like maybe 10 years or 20 years or so, uh, that the Yang Qing pedal became uh, in fashion. So the pedal is not there like a sustained pedal because the Yang Qing itself is already resonant. You don't need a sustained pedal. The pedal is a mute pedal. So the pedal helps to cut the sound immediately. So I played with that 
part, you know, da -da 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 -da, I, I actually played with the resonant, uh, resonance of the instrument. So I cut certain places and I also hit the strings that are on the other side of the bridge. Because on the Yang Qing, we can only hit uh, close to the bridge. You know, there's a certain spot that we need to hit mm -hmm. in order to get the right note produced in the right way. But if you play on the other side of the bridge, there are overtones that are created. So I was playing the overtones at the side. And um, I was, I'm definitely not the first person who's doing this. I think there are definitely other composers who have done this. There's one piece by a Chinese composer called uh, Zhang Chao. Uh, he wrote a Yang Qing Concerto in 2017 called Pan Gu. And Pan Gu is actually a primordial deity uh, that created the, uh, that separated the heaven and the earth. Uh, and his whole body became the geography of the of wow, the earth okay. so that's the legend Daoist legend so he was like the creator you know in in chinese mythology so that piece is about uh this this mythical being so there are a lot of sounds that are explored in the concerto so he actually also played with the muted the mute pedal in one uh, particular section and that was so fascinating so i decided to use that in my use that approach in my music yeah no, I love that too because you're loyal, you're also not afraid to say I like that sound, that piece. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use it. Yeah. Because oftentimes I I find that a lot of composers in general they're afraid to do that. You know. Yeah. So oh, I don't want to use that sound. I need to come up with my own sound. But so that that sound works. Use that sound. Yeah. Nobody knows that you use that sound, right? Mm -hmm. And you use it. You're going to use it in such a different way anyway, mm -hmm. right? And you're using it with the string quartet. Yes. You're not using it in, with orchestra. Yeah. Right, you're using it in a different context. It's gonna sound different. Yes. Right. Yeah. It's like you step into the stream of water, but the water is always different every time you step on it. Although you are stepping on the same place, but the water is. Again, you can you articulate it better than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got I got to ask you something else because uh, about the the Chinese instruments in general because I I deal with this personally. Um, I'm never in a piece where. I use a traditional Arabic instrument. Oh. I don't use kanun. I don't use oud. Mm. Um, I don't use ne. Mm -hmm. And part of it is I don't have the, the technical facility to play any of these instruments mm. like you do. And the other part of it is I feel that um, you need a certain level of mastery mm -hmm. in the traditional yes. playing and also the conservatory training. Yeah. You need both to be able to play that kind of music in a successful way, yeah. in a convincing, not successful, convincing way. Right. And I don't know how you feel about this. Do you think that you you yourself needed to be able to play that instrument, to be able to write for it? Mm -hmm. Or is it is it is it a situation where, uh, no, you, you don't really need to play that instrument. I mean, if you know somebody that plays it, you can learn enough to be able to write a piece like you wrote uh, with quartet. Mm. That's a really good question because I, I believe that I needed to have the technical facility to perform my own piece if I were to write for myself. You know, if I didn't want any other player of the Yang, yang Qing instrument to, if I didn't want any other Yang Qing player to write a piece, um, I mean, if I wanted them to write the piece, you know, it doesn't matter if I can play it or not, as long as I can imagine the sound and I know the instrument inside out. Because there are some composers who don't play an instrument, but they may write for the instrument better than composers who can play that instrument. But for me, I'm fortunate enough to be able to play that instrument for a few years already. I didn't have conservatory training, so I played the instrument from 7 to 18. With a, and learned it with a teacher or two. And then I came to Juliet and I brought the instrument with me. So I kept playing on the instrument. I played in gigs here. Um, I never wanted to forget how to play that instrument. And I was able to keep some of the technical uh, proficiency that I developed. Because in Singapore, I actually um, went for competitions on the instrument. And I also debuted with uh, Singapore Chinese Orchestra as a soloist. So I have some of the skills, but they were getting rusty, you know, because mm. I focus more on composition. So as long as I could play my own pieces that I'm writing for myself or for that instrument, I feel I am in the right position to play it. But if I were to write for totally different, like the oud, for example, uh, and even if I know the sound of the wood very well, it doesn't mean that I know the fingerings, you know, the possibilities and um, the the idiomatic. Uh, um, I didn't. I, it doesn't mean that I'm qualified, because like what you said, I believe that I need to really have some training on the instrument before I choose to perform 
even if it's new music, I feel like I need to have some background. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is kind of my feeling, but it's only my feeling when it comes mm. to these kind of non-Western mm. instruments. But like, I don't know how to play the harp, but I'm going to mm. write for the harp. Yeah. I don't know how to play the piano that well, but I write for the, you know what I mean? Yeah. For whatever reason, with the Western instruments, this approach it's okay for anybody to learn these mm. instruments. It's possible. Mm. But when it comes to the non-Western instruments, mm. there is some kind of uh, distance, I feel like, that mm. we as composers tend to make because we maybe we're afraid to mm. not use the instrument in, a, in, a, in, in the way that it's fully capable. Mm. We're not afraid. We're, we're afraid, rather, to, uh, to make a mistake yeah. when it comes to the instrument. So I, I, this is the question I'm just putting out there because I, I deal with this all the time. Mm. I'm afraid to... Mm. I, I'm also, uh, I don't know the answer because I'm also afraid mm. to use uh, these instruments in my music, even though I find the sounds completely fascinating. It's, it's why I write music. Mm. I love those sounds and I'm trying to in a way to process them. But then my way of taking them out is through Western, mm. <laughs> Western symphonic instruments, which is uh, quite strange. And, and you have the same kind of thing going on, but you also bring in the, the non-Western instruments, but you... Like what you said, they're not at the forefront. They're obligato. They're mm. kind of more in the background. Yeah. So I feel like that is also mm. uh, going inside your mentality too when you're mm. writing. I, see I don't them know if I'm as, wrong about this. As equals to the right. Western instruments that I'm writing for, I didn't want to. And I sometimes I have to admit I take that traditional aspect out of these instruments because I see them as new instruments. Actually, because uh, I feel that traditional instruments why people are so afraid to use them because they attach a lot of cultural history to the instrument. They attach a whole lineage of masters on that instrument. So they feel like, oh, I'm not qualified to do this because, you know, I'm not of that heritage, for example, or, you know, I didn't learn that instrument from a guru. So I am not qualified at all. But as composers, I think we are tasked with this mission to always listen up to what people can't really detect in this instrument, which is the rawness and freshness that these mm. instruments can bring. So the yangqing itself, you know, some people when they hear it, you know, it's you know, compared to the other Chinese instruments, the yangqing is not the most popular one. Like we we see much more examples, you know, of people playing the erhu, the pipa, the lute, or the dizi, the Chinese flute, or the guzheng, the twenty-one string zither, but the yangqing is like, what is that? Like it looks like a like a chimbalong, but I didn't know that there's a Chinese counterpart. That's what a lot of people tell me. But you know, people's first impression of the instrument is oh, very angelic sounding. You know, very soft and an echoey instrument, and that's it. Like oh, beautiful instrument, yay, wonderful. But I wanted them to see like the grotesque side of the instrument. I wanted mm. them to see That's that this point. instrument yeah. is actually very raw and fresh depending on the way you treat it, you see it. So we don't have to always think about the culture surrounding it. Like we, it's okay to extract that out and then write it as, you know, as objectively as we can and then think of it in terms of sonic combinations, like what kind of new sounds we can achieve. The, there's one, um, there are two albums by the Prism Quartet and Music from China members that were released, I'm, I'm not sure when, but it's called Antiphony and uh, what is it? There's, there's, uh, there's another one I forgot, but they work with traditional instrumentalists and you, we would be surprised at what kind of sounds that were attained from that um, the spark it's it's just so amazing like i i viewed them in a different light like after hearing music like this so it's 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 i feel that we shouldn't be too hard on on ourselves and always like you know <laughs> chide ourselves for not that's being qualified our, that's our nature though, yeah if we have if we have musicians who play if we have friends who play these instruments we're very lucky and it would be great to learn from them as much as we can of course and who knows they could inspire us in writing for their instruments and you know more vocabularies vocabularies could be created for that and that instrument it's more like spending the repertoire and the capabilities of that instrument that mm -hmm. i feel that we should do no i that's i learned a lot with you the way you speak about this because i'm i'm just deathly afraid <laughs> you know of, of doing it but uh it's uh i'm glad that you're doing it with such facility because it's inspiring it's that's, that's what we need to hear you know as composers that are interested in going outside the box mm -hmm. especially outside the western yeah. box so to speak but like if we if we keep going down this line right you know we have we did the solo violin piece right which is a pretty yeah. western i mean yeah. you can't get much more you know yeah. eurocentric than a solo violin piece mm -hmm. the string quartet with the yangqin 
then you have a piece that's all completely uh, Chinese instruments, all four of them. Yeah. And I don't know how to pronounce the name of this piece, so I'm going to let you do it. Okay. <laughs> What's this piece called? Uh, this piece is called Drunken Sui. Uh, it's for a Chinese traditional quartet. The instruments consist of the suona, which is like a shom, but the Chinese version of that, a very loud instrument. And then we have the erhu, the two-string fiddle. We have the zhongran, a guitar like uh, lute, and then finally we have the gu zheng, a 21 string zither that we play with fingernails. Yeah. Okay, great, let's hear it. This piece here, it goes all the way, mm -hmm. so you don't even have any Western instruments in here. It's completely non-Western yeah. instruments, I mean Chinese instruments more specifically. Mm -hmm. But then the fascinating thing I, f I find about this most of all is that it's all completely notated and there's mm -hmm. a conductor. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? Because these instrumentalists, they're not trained to play that way, mm -hmm. right? So they have to keep their own idiomatic way of playing, but with this piece of paper in front of them mm -hmm. with notation that has nothing to do with how they learn the instrument, right? So these instrumentalists actually were trained to follow conductors uh, through their experiences playing in chamber ensembles and orchestras. Because we have a lot of Chinese orchestras in Singapore and Chinese chamber groups. And they were also conservatory trained. So we have uh, institutions in Singapore that have this Chinese instrumental program for undergrads and masters. So these instrumentalists, they are so amazing. Some of them are also prize winners of the uh, Chinese music competition in Singapore, the national competition. So they are of the highest caliber, in my opinion. So I'm very lucky to have them. So playing with a conductor, it's, it's quite second nature to them. So they are doing it really well and um, yeah. I mean, do these players also play Western instruments in addition to, so like the person playing the Eru, mm -hmm. right? That person is, can also play the violin? Oh, or is no. that, or does, does that overlap not They are exist? mostly only Chinese instrumentalists, okay. but they have played in Chinese orchestras and Chinese chamber groups. So they are used to following conductors. Okay, so like yeah. when they're growing up playing the instrument, mm -hmm. the conductor is almost like a second nature. Yes. It's not a strange thing that somebody is up there. Yes. But it, that's not the tradition, though, I'm assuming, and the, going back hundreds of years. The most authentic tra tradition of uh -huh. folk uh, tradition, I have to say, is where you know, everything is passed down orally and you are playing it in big groups and you don't need to, a conductor, you can coordinate yourselves, right? But in, in, a, in a modern society like Singapore right now, like, and in China and all the conservatories, they have uh, systemized everything. So that led to you know, us learning music in a more Western European way, which is to have scores in front of us. And wow. Um, yeah, so I, I grew up looking at scores while playing at the instrument. So most Chinese instrumentalists read a cipher notation, which is numbered notation. Um, and uh, 
um, more of us are now trained in reading stuff, Western stuff notation, because you know a lot of new music are written in that uh, notation nowadays. So that train us to be able to read that quickly. So these instrumentalists are fine with reading Western. Music Do you scores. think that takes away from the music making at all that they mm. have notation from such an early time when they're? When they're learning the instrument, or do you think, oh, this is just something that mm, we are you Westerners talking about cipher notation about? or Western staff notation? Western staff notation, like what you, mm. what like what, how you wrote this piece. Mm. Do you think that hinders the? Mm. I don't know what you want to call it, the authenticity of, of the oral tradition mm -hmm. being passed down. Does mm -hmm. it is it is it a wedge in between that, or actually is it just an additional tool? Is it or is it not either? <laughs> maybe I, I'm. Yeah, I think it's a more standardized and accessible tool for people who are not like Chinese instrumentalists themselves, like composers who you know have a Western musical background and they are interested to write for Chinese instruments. They can get access to these players by writing it in a more universal or more standardized Western staff notation that these instrumentalists could also understand. Um, I think the cipher notation. It's, it's really interesting. The cipher notation doesn't have much detail regarding expression or, uh, let's say, dynamics. Like, if you look at a, a traditional music score or tablature, you know, from the Ming Dynasty or um, Qing Dynasty cipher notation, you see that everything is kind of empty. Like, it's like looking at Bach manuscripts. You, know, you don't really see dynamics or crescendos, you know. You, it's all up to the interpreter. It's all up to the teacher who teaches, you know, a group of students, their choices, you know, their, the way they feel the music. Mm, but in Western notation, we're now, because of so many years of uh, history, we, we are accustomed to seeing very detailed instructions like dynamics, right, tempo markings and stuff. But in Chinese cipher notation, maybe you see the, te the tempo marking, the meter, but you don't really see uh, dynamic details, for example. So that does take away, you know, looking at Western notation where we, we see what the composer wants, we, we are following whatever the composer wants, that we can't really think for ourselves, you know, how, how else would we like to interpret it. Uh, I think that's the whole thing about the conservatory system and the whole thing about looking at scores is that it takes away part of our senses, which is the oral sense. They were relying more about our, on our sense of sight and then translating that into our playing. So I think it definitely takes away, but it also adds because it helps to broaden the people who could write for these instruments. It also helps to enforce, reinforce the, the, the potency of the composer in what they want for the music themselves because you know you everything is written clearly but in new music it works because new music has become really composer centric these days especially for chinese traditional new music you know but you know if you if you're writing a part where you want the instrumentalist to just be free in expressing then you could notate that on the score as well now, that's one part in my piece where i use the mouthpiece of the sona to create the pew, 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 pew sound. Oh yes, part. yes, I remember this. Yeah, yes. so that's actually a traditional technique. You know, other traditional pieces have used it before, but to our ears, our Western trained ears, so called, like we we find this technique very refreshing and new. So what's new to us? It's actually old in the heritage. So it's great to be able to you know oscillate between these two worlds. And this is what I tell people all the time too, like. Nothing that we write, we call it new music, but none of it is new. Mm, yeah. Maybe it's new in way the ways we put it together, yes, right? Yes. Or maybe it's new because you put it on a program with a bunch of pieces that all, all sound very different. Yeah. Or maybe it's just new because we're writing it now. Maybe yeah. that's the only thing that makes it new. You're right. Yeah. So, I mean, I appreciate you coming on. This was great. I learned a lot on this. Oh. And, uh, and uh, until Thank next time. Thank you for having Thank me. You. Thank you.